At the risk of stating the obvious, this is a healing story. But who's being healed? Certainly the woman is being healed. After having been bent over for 18 long years, she's finally able to stand up straight. But is she the only one? I notice as I read this story that her infirmity is very peculiar and specific. She's not suffering from bleeding or feeling poorly or mentally ill. She's bent over. Luke says she has a spirit of weakness. That's what he calls it, a spirit of weakness. That's oddly specific, isn't it? Maybe she's got a spinal problem, but then we'd expect her to be paralyzed. Maybe it's anemia, but then how could she move about at all? And the Greek word that describes this woman's posture can also to bow in a gesture of humility or of humiliation. I can see how a spirit of weakness could leave her that way. And the word that Jesus uses to cure her ailment is not heal or cure or rise or even save, which is used very often in healing stories. It's to set free. Jesus doesn't say that very much, not in this, way, in this sense. Interestingly, that same word can also be used to describe the official dissolution of a marriage. Now, I doubt that D Jesus is granting this woman a divorce, but isn't that interesting? The way that Jesus helps this woman is by setting her free, but free from what or from whom? Apart from the spirit of weakness which has her bent over, her main problem in this story seems to be the leader of the synagogue. The man who thinks that this woman should wait patiently and humbly, dare I say, and until later to be healed. Who thinks that this thing that Jesus has done is improper and a violation of God's law. And so I wonder if one of the things from which this from which Jesus is freeing this woman is the power of this man who would rather keep her bent over and powerless. Because I also notice that at the beginning of this encounter, Jesus addresses her as woman, a term that's roughly equivalent to ma'am in English. It's a polite but general form of address. But by the end of the story, Jesus is referring to her as a daughter of Abraham, He's pointing past her powerlessness or her weakness as a woman or as a person with an illness and is lifting her up both literally and metaphorically by citing her equal status with that of the synagogue leader as a human being and as a descendant of Abraham. So again, I wonder who else in this story might be experiencing healing. The setting of this narrative in the synagogue, of course, is meant to highlight the irony and, frankly, the hypocrisy of Jesus' opponents in the story, right? Jesus is obviously doing God's work. It's the work of Satan to bind and afflict. It's God's work to heal and restore and set free. That's what Jesus says in his very first sermon, right? So why is God's son doing God's work in God's house on God's holy day met with indignation and opposition? The story is a commentary on a religious system that is so misguided that it can't recognize the very God that it purports to worship. Why do you suppose it is this way? Now, as Christians, it might be tempting to read this story as a criticism of Judaism. But just ask single mothers and divorcees how welcoming the church has been to them. Ask gay and lesbian folks, or trans or non-binary folks, whether the leaders of Christian congregations have met them with affirmation or indignation. Clearly, this is not a Jewish problem. This is a human problem. And it's a problem that persists to this day. So what is the cause of our ailment? 
The synagogue leader is indignant because God expressly commanded that on the Sabbath day, no work was to be done. But why do you suppose God handed down that law? Let's think about that for a moment. Remember the story, right? The Hebrews had left slavery in Egypt and were on their way to create their very own nation. Had they gone straight from Egypt to Canaan, what kind of nation do you think these people, having lived for generations in Egypt as slaves, would have created? Egypt was all they knew. Slavery was all they could imagine. And yet here, instead of forced labor, is a commandment enforcing rest. God's law and the wilderness preparation that accompanied it gave them a different framework upon which to build their new culture. It helped them imagine something new. And that's what religions do. They're frameworks. They help us look beyond ourselves to something greater, whether that something is a new kind of society or even a different way of being and the one we're in. Laws and commandments and doctrines and I think even, frankly, scriptures are all tools to help us look beyond what's in front of us and see what lies further down the road and the direction that God is taking us. In the letter to the Hebrews, we've been reading for several weeks now about faith. We read about the faith of Abraham, who left behind everything to settle in a foreign land and live out his life as an immigrant. We read about the faith of the saints and heroes of old who did these great things and yet still never received the promise into which they put their faith. The author's goal through all of this has been to encourage their readers to keep looking beyond what's right in front of them. And that includes uncertainty and hardship and disappointment and even persecution and to continue in the direction that God is pointing them. Today, the letter reminds us that we have not come to something that can be touched, recounting how when the Hebrew people first received the law at Sinai, God was physically present on the mountain, a literal mountain that they could touch, although they weren't supposed to. And they knew that God was there because of what their senses told them. They saw darkness, gloom, a blazing fire, tempest. They heard a trumpet. They heard an excruciating voice with which God spoke. But none of those things were God. They were all signs that pointed to God, tools that God used to communicate. That's true of the law and of the Jewish tradition built around it. Now, as I read St. Luke's story, I notice how the synagogue leader seems to know the law very well, but evidently doesn't know God. He's familiar with what can be touched, but not with the one to whom that thing points. I wonder if he's even aware of the distinction. The letter to the Hebrews goes on to remind us that all these things that can be touched, things like law and religious tradition, will one day be shaken, which is to say, removed or destroyed. In other words, they're temporary things. And they have to be, right? Because only God is eternal. I wonder then, since this is a healing story, I wonder if the synagogue leader and all the rest of Jesus' opponents are also being healed in this story. I wonder if there's something that's keeping them bent over. Because where are your eyes when you're bent over? It's on the ground, on the earth, the thing, the earth, the very earth that God has vowed to shake. Your eyes can never look up to God. So what do you think? Does Jesus free these folks as well? Help them to see God in a new way? How do you think that felt for them in that moment? Do you think they rejoiced like the crowds did, or did they feel something else? From there, I have to wonder what sorts of things might be bending us over, keeping our eyes pointed 
at the ground, at the things that can be touched. It was God's own law that kept the leader of the synagogue from seeing God at work that day. If Jewish tradition and God's law are shakable, might not the same be true for our Christian tradition, our Christian doctrines? God chooses to reveal God's self paradoxically by hiding themself in things like this. God is hidden within nature, and so nature can reveal God. God is hidden within religious traditions, and so these traditions reveal God. But that also means that the very things in which God chooses to reveal themselves to us are also capable of hiding God from us. Although God is in these things, God is not these things. God is not the church. God is not our religion. God is not our creed. God is not our scripture. All these are things that can be touched, impermanent, and destined to be removed. And yet, these things are how God chooses to be made known to us. Perhaps because our tiny minds cannot comprehend God directly. Jesus speaks in parables to make his points more accessible to ordinary folks. Maybe God hides themselves in creation for the same reason. But whatever the case may be, the result is the same. We can only know God indirectly, at least for now. Because eventually, the promise is that we will know God fully and directly. St. Paul writes, Then I will know fully, I see, now I know partially, I see as in a mirror dimly, then I will see fully. Then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. That's the promise we've been reading about. This better heavenly country, this homeland for which we're bound, where together with the saints and the martyrs, we will be made complete or perfect in God. That's the promise where faith directs us. It might help to think about it like this. Rebecca shared a story this week about, how, uh, about going up with David to Mount Rainier recently and seeing the mountain out for the first time in 25 years. 25 years they've been going to this mountain, and it's always been cloudy. What luck, huh? Every time, even in the summer, there was always clouds. All those years, she said, they went and they imagined what it would look like from those brief glimpses they would catch through the mist. But nothing could compare with seeing the whole thing in its majesty. That's what faith is like. Throughout life, we only ever get obscured, partial glimpses of God. Maybe because that's all we can handle. But we have faith that one day the mountain will be out. And we will see it. And we keep coming back, hoping and looking for that day. Now, imagine getting in your car and driving all the way up to paradise and parking in the lot and then pulling out your phone and scrolling through pictures of the mountain. <laughs> Photos are not the same. They can't do it justice. They can never compare to the real thing. But I read this story and I wonder if that's what the faith of the synagogue leader has him doing, scrolling on his phone in the parking lot at paradise. Meanwhile, the mountain is out, if only he'd just look out the window. <laughs> and so I have to ask today, what are those things that bend us over from which we need Jesus to free us? What are the photos of God that we're scrolling through on our phones that are keeping us tucked away in our cars rather than hiking on the paths? What are the clouds that get in our way but also give us these delicious and tantalizing glimpses of what's behind them. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith is knowing that even when we can't see it, it's there. So how do we live like the mountain is out? <laughs>